Hi everybody, Josh Byerly here inside Mission Control Houston. I'm joined by Ginger Carrick, a flight director, also works for Mission Operations. We are here to take your, well, she's here to take your questions. I'm probably gonna be a little bit quiet because Ginger's the smart one. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get your uh, questions there in El Paso. Hi, my name is Alexis and my question is, what did you study at Hanks High School in El Paso and at Texas Tech University that prepared you for work at NASA? Hi, Alexis. I studied physics. Um, I enjoyed all math and science classes in high school, but when I went to Texas Tech, I majored in physics and got my master's, uh, my bachelor's and my master's degree. And the reason it helps is physics provides you a very broad base of all the t different types of sciences. And uh, here at NASA, we work with all different kinds of sciences. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Adrian Perez, and my question is, did you have a special teacher in high school that pushed you toward your NASA goals? Um, hi, Adrian. Yes, I certainly did. Um, my high school chemistry teacher, his name was Henry Masterson, and uh, he always encouraged me to to um, do really well in my in my classes. But um, I remember he also encouraged me to stay home when we had the shuttle launches. And so even if I had to miss chemistry class, he thought it was more important for me to pursue my interest at NASA. Although I had to do extra work to make sure that that I my grades stayed up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cecily, and my question is, what was it like being at NASA intern, and how can I apply to work at NASA in the future? Um, I loved being a NASA intern. I can still remember the very first day that I came on site, and uh, when you drive in, you used to be able to see the big Saturn rocket, and I thought, my gosh, I have scored. I finally got here, um, and I was uh, able to work on a lot of in interesting projects, but um, anyone, if you have a good GPA, and, and uh, primarily if you're interested in math and science, but they do offer other internships as well, but you can go to um, interns.nasa.gov, and it'll tell you all about how to apply to be a NASA intern. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erica and my question is, you are the first non-astronaut CapCon. What is a CapCon and why, is, why was the position only held by astronauts? That's uh, an interesting question. So the CAPCOM is short for capsule communicator, but really it's the person in mission control that talks to the crew. So when the crew says, Houston, we have a problem, I'd be the person to key the mic and ask them what their problem is. Um, Historically, it has always been an astronaut because the people that were in space wanted to talk to somebody on the ground that had seen what they had seen, been where they had been, and thought like a crew member. Um, I was able to perform this task to be the first person because for the International Space Station, when we had the first crew on board, there were no astronauts that had seen what they had seen and been where they had been since they were the first one. But I had an opportunity to train four years with that crew, so I was in a better position to do that. And now it's a career path for um, um, a lot of different non-astronauts. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sally, and my question is, what different positions do you hold in mission control before becoming a flight director? Um, the path to a flight director, normally you sit in one of the consoles here in Mission Control. We have a bunch of different ones, but the only one that I had ever sat at was the CAPCOM or the Capsule Communicator console. Thank you. My, na my name is Jennifer. My question is, how do astronauts train to do spacewalks and how does Mission Control support spacewalks on the ISS? Okay, so spacewalk is a very dangerous event, and, and we've had some recently where we that has uh, really uh, come into play. But So we want to make sure the crews are as prepared as they possibly can be. Um, one of the ways that we can train is we have this very large swimming pool where we will take the astronaut in the suit and put them in the swimming pool because that's really the only place you can simulate uh, to the best of our abilities, not a zero gravity. I, I wish we had a zero gravity room. Sometimes you watch some of these movies and you think we have one, but we do not. So we practice that in the pool and they practice the tasks that they will do outside. They also practice their communication with the folks here in Mission Control so that when we're ready on the day of the event, we have a full team in here and people have practiced and they understand what the tasks the crews are going to perform and they also even practice what if this goes wrong 
wrong? What if that goes wrong? And uh, um, so that on the day of execution, everybody is prepared for anything that could happen. Uh, my name is Destiny. My question is, how is one chosen to be the flight director and how long do you train? Wow. So it, it's actually fairly competitive to be a flight director. I forget how many we're up to now, 88? It's going to be in the 80s, yeah. Yeah. So in the history of the program since 1958, there have only been uh, about 88 or so flight directors. So every couple of years, um, and we accept applications, and it's usually a top performer in one of the other system areas here, and potentially people that have management experience. Um, I got in in 2005 with a class of eight other individuals. Um, and then I started my training to do a basic space station operations. It requires about nine months to a year of training. Once you uh, get working in here, then they allow you to do um, other events that are a little bit more complicated, like docking, um, uh, bringing in a new vehicle and letting that vehicle attach to the space station or conducting spacewalks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bella Lawrence, and my question is, is there anyone outside of mission control that tells the flight director what he or she should do? Um, besides my mother, no. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, okay. in, the, in mission control, you have one person in charge and one person only. Um, I will give you an example. If the, if the president himself, if I were executing a mission, and the president walked in and directed me to do something different that I thought was unsafe for either the crew or the vehicle, I have full authority to override that decision. So we have to set it up that way to protect the safety of the crew and the safety of our space station. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Lizette Garza, and my question is, how many positions are in mission control, and how are you chosen to work in a particular position? Let's look around. Probably Lots. 20. Yeah. It looks like there's about 20 of us in here today. So this is what you're, what you're seeing now is mission control during the, the, the daytime hours. Um, right now the crew is on the second half of their work day and they will be going to sleep um, a little bit later this afternoon around 3.30 our time. When they go to sleep, this room will have roughly about five or six people in here. So we down staff where people are just monitoring the space station systems while the crew sleeps. Um, the second part of your question was, uh, I think, how um, you, you become a flight controller. Um, you study math and science. A lot of these folks have um, bachelor's degrees in math, science, engineering. Um, they don't necessarily work in their specialty. Say you studied mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, you might find yourself working with computers. Um, but uh, the important thing is they, they learn how to think as a critical problem solver by studying these subjects, and then we um, make use of those skills here in Mission Control. Hi, my name is Adrian Dinger, and my question is, what is the most difficult emotional obstacle that you must overcome while a mission is going on, and how do you cope with this? Uh, that's a good question. So sometimes I would work missions in here when my best friends were on orbit. And uh, you worry about them as your friend. You, I'm a physicist, so when they are getting ready to launch, I understand the physics of the rocket. And in my scientific mind, I know that it's safe. But in my emotional side, mm -hmm. that's my friend. And they're being attached to this big old rocket and something might happen. Um, you have to compartmentalize that. You, you cannot let emotions um, feed into the job that you have to do here. Um, I have had a grandmother pass away during uh, a mission that I was working where I had to deal with that afterwards. And uh, there's been some scary situations in here, but you cannot exhibit that in front of the team because you are their leader and you need to make sure that everybody remains calm. Hi, my name is Ariana, and my question is, how does mission control work through problems? Oh, well, we work as a team. That is the most important part about working in mission control. We have a lot of individually smart people but uh, and I, that I look to to ask very detailed questions, but ultimately we, we discuss um, the, uh, the problem that we're facing and get inputs from everybody, whether you're the one that's... Um, that's the smartest in that area or not. And then as a team, collectively, we uh, make decisions. It's very methodical. It, it's, uh, that's one comment I always tell people is it's not like the movies at all. Like you see the oh. movies, it's all dramatic and crazy with music playing. And then that's not, at, I think that's the first thing people realize whenever they walk in here is it's not like this very thought through and calm, actually. So. 
Hello, my name is Miguel, and my question is, have you seen the movie Gravity? Does it scare you? And how likely would such a scenario be? I knew somebody was going to ask me that. So, no, I didn't get time. I was very busy, and I never What? made it to get, I did. I never made it to go see it, and then, so I'm looking for it on, on Netflix or whatever. But, so I will eventually watch that. I have heard about it, and um, no, no, no. So when we do spacewalks, we always make sure there are two what they call tethers hooking together. We would never, ever, ever be in a scenario where our crew member would be free flying. Now, I say never, never. If something really very strange were to happen, and we did, uh, the crews are actually equipped with these little backpacks that can help them get back to structure. Um, but I think in the movie there's a piece of debris that comes. A lot of debris, yeah. We monitor debris all the time, so the chances of that surprising us, especially during a spacewalk, nah, nah, nah. But I hear it's a good movie. <laughs> my name is Helene Bach, and my question is, have the astronauts ever experienced a danger that required them to leave the International Space Station? Ah, that's, a good, that's an excellent good question. question. So that worries us. Um, so far to date, we have never had to do that, but we have come close. Um, as I mentioned, those pieces of debris that we talked about for the movie, um, we have um, flight controllers here that monitor all, you've heard of space junk. So things that are out there floating around that if they come in contact with the space station could puncture the whole of the space station and cause all the air to go out. Um, normally we know about these things way in advance and what we do is we use our reboost engines and we move the space station out of the way of the debris. But sometimes there are items that we maybe didn't know, we weren't able to track as well, that come in with a late notice and the only thing we can do is tell the crew, go into your Soyuz or your crew return capsule, shut the hatch and wait for us to tell you that it's all clear and we've had to do that what three times yeah, in the history of this space station thank you hi my name is kelsey Barron, and my question is what do you do while everything on a mission is going well <laughs> we, we say thank you yeah. um we uh we are always very busy in here so those when we're watching a mission and everything's going smoothly we're looking at you know what the crew is doing tomorrow what the crew is doing the next day uh we're talking about hardware failures that that uh, we have been working on that we need to reach a resolution on in a couple of weeks um so there there are other things that we can do that if uh, the crew doesn't need us right now but we're always monitoring the systems on board to make sure that the system is still uh, operating nominally okay thank you hello my name is gabriel and my question is what type of projects are you currently involved in uh, so right now uh, i was a flight director for eight years uh, but for the last year i have uh, been reassigned to a management position so I am looking at um, what mission control will look like in next year and in five years from now. As you know, the space station has been um, authorized to operate till 2024. So my job is to make sure that I have all the right people in place to do that and that we have all the right equipment in here to be able to continue to support space station operations. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Coleman, and my question is, what kind of science is conducted on the International Space Station? Oh, wow. What kind of science is not conducted on the International Space Station? So now that we have it constructed, we, that's, we're busy doing that every day. Um, we have a lot of human health science, um, biology, biology some earth science, yeah. physics, space science. Um, primarily, we're studying, we want to understand the effects of space on the human body so that if you know folks decide we want to go beyond low earth orbit, that we understand what we need to protect the astronauts from. Um, and we're also testing out new systems that we would use on these long duration missions, like if we were going to, the Mar to Mars or to the moon, um, that uh, systems that we don't have currently in-house right now, we use the space station to test those out and we consider that science as well. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber. Why is the International Space Station worth doing? Wow, there are hundreds of different answers to this question. Um, 
I, from my position, I can see the benefits that our research has on um, uh, on the general population. Let me give you an example. You know, uh, my mom has osteoporosis. What what that means is you get a weakening of the of your bones as you age and they become more brittle. Um, in space, we're able to conduct experiments because uh, the, the crew members lose um, calcium from their bones and their bones are also um, starting to weaken. So we've been able to do some experiments on board that now are in, you know, can go through clinical trials and be given to people on the earth and maybe my mom, you know, or me before that happens to me, um, I can benefit from that. Uh, there's also some cancer research that we're doing on how to provide localized breast cancer treatment. Um, and I know a lot of people with breast cancer. So for me, it's the human health benefits. Um, there's also the benefits of just working together with, we work with 16 different countries. And um, you know, while our politicians may not always get along, we are a shiny example of how uh, people from different backgrounds and different cultures can get along and work together to produce something as wonderful as the International Space Station. <laughs> Hi, my name is Justin. My question is, do the sol sun's solar flares affect the people and vehicles in space? If so, how are they protected? Ah, yes. So we have a separate group of people that are watching for these solar flares. And, you know, these are huge bursts of energy. And sometimes um, they can have, uh, as you maybe have seen in the news, uh, you know, uh, impacts on cell phone coverage. They can have impacts on, um, you know, different um, mm -hmm. communications of, of uh, between a satellite and the space station. So we like to keep aware of those um, so that we're, it's not unexpected when it happens. But we do have radiation shielding um, across a majority of the International Space Station that is able to protect the crews from that. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and my question is when NASA returns to the moon, what type of research will be done and how would we benefit it and when will NASA send astronauts to the moon again? Oh. Well, you know, I, I would be happy for us to go to the moon as well. Um, currently, right now, we have no plans to do so. So what we're, we're doing is focusing our efforts on using the International Space Station to test out technologies and uh, communication practices that we can use whenever the decision is made to go to the moon. Hello, my name is Adam. Um, my question is, are you aware of any changes in height due to, due to being in space? Ah, excellent question. Yes. So when you're on Earth, you, with the benefits of gravity, you your spine gets compressed. And we have found that when the crew members get up in the space, their spine elongates a little bit, maybe a, you know, up, up to an inch and in some an, cases. Yeah, it's about an inch. Um, so we actually plan for that because, you know, they do get fitted for their spacesuits. And you wouldn't want to be, you know, fitted for a spacesuit. And then you go up, and all of a sudden, now you're bonking your top of your head at your space helmet. So we make sure we, we allow for that uh, that growth. And then when they come back, they can be tall for like the first day or so, and it eventually Maybe settles it, out. It actually makes their lower back kind of hurt yeah. a little bit sometimes because the, the way their spine is stretching. So it's not exactly, I mean, I would love to be taller, but you know, not if it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Kevin, and my question is, what is the longest a human has lived in space? Aha, the longest a human has lived in space. It is about 430 yeah. days. We just uh, looked this up before we came yes, on the Yes, we air. did. So it was 430 days, and it was uh, one of the Russian cosmonauts mm -hmm. that flew on board the Mir space station. Um, for the International Space Station, we try to limit the stay to about six months, uh, but there was one mission that I was actually the lead flight director for where Michael Lopez Alegria um, had to stay for 201 days. Mm -hmm. It's a long time. Thank you. Hi, my name's Adam. My question is, do you believe in extraterrestrial life and why or why not? Hmm, this is an interesting question. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe. Um, surely, as large as the universe is, we're not the only ones. But I don't have any direct evidence of any of that. I don't know any secrets. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Carlos Jimenez, and my question is, is there any plans for the planet Mars in the next 20 years? 
You know, right now, NASA doesn't have any plans. I've heard of some other plans outside of NASA of people um, looking at going um, to Mars. Uh, but again, it's the same thing we're doing for the moon. The International Space Station is a great test bed um, to be able to be ready with all of the appropriate systems and all the appropriate lessons learned if um, our, our, uh, the decision is made to go to Mars. Hi, my name is Jorge, and my question is, what role will mission control play in a mission to Mars? Ah, okay. So going to Mars would be different with respect to communications. Right now, we can call the crew at pretty much any time, any day. We have great communications coverage, um, and that's because they are, you know, right above us. Uh, but when you go to Mars, uh, we won't always have a direct communication link to them, so they need to be as autonomous as we can possibly make them. And we need to be here to kind of support only for things that um, are, are operating out of the nominal plan or, um, uh, or have failed in ways differently than we had anticipated, because we will provide them with procedures to keep the systems running, and then we'll provide them with a ne another set of procedures in case this fails or that fails, but there could be things that we didn't think of. Um, so we're looking at different uh, communications um, uh, links that we can have with them, either by voice or a text message that they can send that might get the information back and forth quicker. But ultimately, we will be, they'll be pretty much primary, and we will be here to help guide them along. I think that's it. So we want to thank you guys very much for your time. It's been fun. I uh, hope you guys have a good day there at El Paso. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later.